there is a such thing as food quality, Mm -hmm. but if all you know about is food quality and you have no awareness of food quantity, Mm -hmm. then you can take a high quality diet all the way to an early grave. If you're eating overall too much, right. Yeah. In terms of, in terms of energy. And so, yeah, that's a concept that a lot of people in, in the general public are not aware of. Welcome to Cut the Crap with Beth and Matt, the world's number one no bullshit health and fitness podcast. Are you ready to cut the crap with your diet and exercise, get strong as fuck, and build a healthy relationship with food? Then you've come to the right place. Show your support for the podcast by joining our Patreon community, where you get exclusive content, which consists of monthly workouts you can do at home or at the gym, monthly challenges that are either strength, habit, or mindset based and access to hundreds of lower calorie, higher protein, family-friendly recipes. And now all Patreon members receive exclusive access to a private Facebook group. Now Now let's let's cut cut the crap. crap. Hey, what's going on, Beth? Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Awesome. Tell us actually how you got into nutrition and the whole beginnings of Alan. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, well, uh, uh, that's the short version. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my, my dad saw something really great in my mom and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you can picture 1992, that's kind of where it all started. So graduated high school in 1990, spent a couple of years in an art major and then one thing led to another, and I was I just went headlong into the nutrition major starting 92. Around that same time, I started personal training. So the first decade of, of my career was personal training while I was completing my nutrition degrees. And then from 2002 to 2012 or so, that second decade consisted of nutritional counseling. And it was during that particular decade that I started getting active online and basically starting the evidence-based movement in the nutrition and, and fitness area and kind of bringing that whole movement online. And when I say evidence-based, I mean uh, not just listening to the most uh, decorated or most successful or, or greatest physique having people online, but rather cross-checking what we see in the trenches with what the weight of the research evidence says on any given dietary claim or or training claim or supplementation claim. And so that was the spirit of the evidence-based movement was combining what we know in the trenches with what we think we know in, in the research. And so that was kind of this new model that, that got ushered in. And so that was 2002 to 2012 or so. And then like the most previous decade has consisted of actually collaborating with the the scientists and doing the research, conducting the trials, doing the reviews of existing trials and conducting meta-analyses of of everyone's findings and sort of seeing the big picture of what we think we know with nutrition and training and And it was really over the past decade that my colleagues and I have been able to put together publications that make the foundation for a lot of the practice guidelines of the current coaches and dietitians and stuff. And so, uh, yeah, when you asked me about the the origins and, and all that, it's, it's a 30 year journey. So that's why it's not amazing. It's a mouthful. (laughs) Right, right, right. And for anyone who's listening, like Alan is our coach's go-to for updated nutrition, evidence-based research. I'm, I am a part of the Alan Aragon Research Review Monthly, so I'm not sure. I think Matt is too. Totally. Uh, so that's totally. where we go to to get the latest information to debunk a lot of the stuff that <laughs> we hear stuff to debunk. <laughs> on uh, TikTok and Instagram. It's a little wild out there. Yeah. I appreciate that, you guys. Oh, totally. yeah, absolutely. We appreciate the work that you put into so we can actually learn about it and help others. Thank you. Thank you. And that's kind of all... Uh, uh, you you talked about like that movement back in 2002 or so. Is, is that what kind of was the the forerunner of uh, flexible dieting, essentially? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. F- or what we know it as dieting. Today. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, it, it it's kind of interesting because I, I have to give Lyle McDonald credit for bringing yes. the the flexible dieting idea to at least the seedy corners of the internet. He might mm-hmm. not have brought it to the mainstream, but 
he brought it to the seedy corners of, of the internet where he and, and, and his followers lurked <laughs> and that wasn't me included. And that was in the, around there, I, I want to say it was like 2005 ish or something okay. like that. Okay. And then flexible dieting existed as a concept in the literature though. In, and as far back as the mid seventies. And then it really started, they really started getting explicit with the term flexible dietary control in the, uh, in the 1990s, in the literature. So, okay. so yeah, yeah. They, there was some coincidence there with the evidence-based movement, the concept of flexible dieting. And yeah, there, there was some overlap there. Amazing. Yeah. So for everybody listening, that might be a new term to them. What is, what is flexible dieting? Yeah. Flexible dieting is kind of the technical definition is a cognitive style of dietary restraint. So in other words, flexible dieting is an approach to dieting and approach to how we perceive foods and dieting. So a lot of the, the times anyways, in, in, in the modern fitness culture, people synonymize flexible dieting with counting macros. Mm -hmm. And that is actually incorrect. Um, counting macros is one of the options among a very broad continuum of dietary approaches. Mm -hmm. So flexible dieting says, hey, if you like counting macros, then count macros. If you would rather count portions, then count portions. If you would rather not do any of that and just eat more of certain things and less of other things, or if you want to do something more habit-based and make sure you just have protein, a substantial amount of protein with your main meals, yep. mm -hmm. and yeah, go, go, you can go looser and, and less micromanagey or you can go tighter and more micromanaged and, and more quantitative. There's a whole spectrum of approaches to diet and everybody clicks with different ones. Yeah. And sometimes mm -hmm. you click with different approaches throughout the course of the year seasonally. If you're an athlete or if you're just somebody who likes to kind of veer in and out of being really tight with your tracking or really loose or non-existent with your tracking, depending on the season, depending on the mood. So flexible dieting says individualize it. Yeah. There's no one way for everybody that everybody that. should do. So that, that's what flexible dieting is. And, and so flexible dieting is a flexibility of approach. Uh, flexible dieting allows degrees of rigidity mm -hmm. among the approaches. And flexible dieting says, while one person will do just fine their whole lives, never tracking a single gram, there will be other folks who actually thrive on, on that sort of thing. And it helps them stay on track and they enjoy it and they succeed and they reach their goals. So, so be it, let them do that. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's other different things to, to the concept of flexible dieting. Like for example, there's no single best macronutrient breakdown that's ideal mm -hmm. for everybody. Like a lot of times you'll hear people say keto is the best. <laughs> Everybody should go on keto. <laughs> keto is the solution to all of humanity's problems. Yeah. And you, you, people will genuinely believe that. And these yeah. are. That's like, a really good. Go ahead. You what know, were you going to say on that, Beth? Because I think. We I was going to say, we're, yeah. I feel like people identify their diets like it's a religion. Truly. Like, yeah, like sure. intermittent fasting. Like I'm, yeah. I'm an intermittent faster. I do keto. It's like, okay, do I walk around and say, I, I have a diet that works for me? That's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and the, the thing that's tough for people to wrap their brains around is all these approaches, all these approaches are legitimate and, and it just has to be individualized mm -hmm. and it's totally okay for one person to be eating two meals a day while the person next to them eats like six meals a day. It, because ultimately this stuff doesn't really matter in this lifetime or the next and because people have different goals and there's mm -hmm. the difference between people's goals can dictate the, the protocols. Yes, yeah, sure. But people will always have different goals and stuff. So to tie everything together in a nutshell, flexible dieting is the flexibility of approach. And that includes the flexibility of the macronutrient breakdown, flexibility of meal frequency, meal distribution through the day or the week, flexibility across individuals, as far as how you're going to manage the so-called hedonic allotment or your junk food allotment through the course mm -hmm. of the day or course of the week. All of these things should be individualized. And there's no one superior way for any of these aspects. 
And that's kind of the tough thing for people to wrap their heads around because everybody wants to know what's the best way to do it. What, what is the, the, the best way for everybody to diet? And the yeah. disappointing answer is like rules. There, there is no best way. Yeah. Pe- people do like rules and mm-hmm. they like to, they like to keep it simple. And sometimes they like to keep it overly simple, but uh, it's, it's not all that simple. And for some people, it can be super simple depending on the approach they take, but you have to take into account what can the person stick to for the long term. Mm-hmm. Not, a, not everybody will stick to, for example, intermittent fasting for the long term, while others, it'll be a godsend for them. Yeah. If they've been just daily calorically restricting and toughing their way through a diet every day of the week. And then they discover, oh goodness, all I need to do is just kind of fast my way through a couple of days a week. And I reach the same kind of deficit by the end of the week. Wow. Hallelujah. This is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's different with everybody. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I've, I've done intermittent fasting in the past before I discovered a uh, flexible dieting essentially. So I went from essentially carbs are bad going low carb. And then I discovered intermittent fasting probably circa 2012 or so. And then it was like 2013 or 14 when I kind of discovered flexible dieting. And within that, it was if it fits your macros. And that was a, a complete game changer for me. Once I, once I really realized it was all about, for me, macros and that I could fit all these carbs into my um, diet and still reach my health and fitness goals. And that was, that was a game changer. What about, what about you, Beth? What, yeah, that's for, awesome. for the flexible dieting, do you, do you share that same sentiment? Do you have any experience with like how flexible dieting it worked for you? Yeah. I just think realizing, and I learned this from Jordan that like anything can fit. Yeah. I, I, I tried it all. Of course, I did everything. I was keto, intermittent fasting, you, you name it, HCG. I did like the 500 day, 500 calorie day thing with that. That was, yeah, nuts. And then I learned that I could, that it all can fit. And it's like, oh, wow, what a game changer when you actually get that. Yeah. Yeah. And people just freak out when they are able to see that. Okay. Well, I don't have to reserve having a cookie or having some pizza to once every few months. Or right. like every once on my birthday and then maybe once on New Year's or something like that. They can see that you can allot for these things if you want to have, in quotes, fun foods or indulgence foods mm-hmm. every day of the week. Mm-hmm. You can allot for it. There's a conversation there about classical conditioning and, and intensifying cravings for these things over time versus diminishing the cravings for them. And once again, it, it's different with everybody. With some yeah. people... It, they, it actually works better for them to just kind of abstain from, from certain types of foods. And mm-hmm. with other folks, if they do that, they'll go through periods where they just binge on it cyclically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you have to know who you are in terms of your relationship with food and then, and then take it from there. Like just me, for example, I am my, my, my sweet tooth or my junk food craving is, is taken care of by having some chocolate each day, uh, one, two, 300 calories worth of chocolate a day. And I'm mm-hmm. good. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm good. And other folks, Hey, there are some folks out there. If you give them a little bit of chocolate, they'll want to eat the whole bag and there's nothing you can do about that. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of figure out who you are in terms of your psychological relationship with food. Yeah. And- I think it's a good goal for everybody to develop a healthy relationship with food to the point where they can have what they want kind of whenever they want, whether it's yes. every day or once a week or once a month or whatever that that case may be. Agreed. That's what we're all about here. Now, would you say intuitive eating and flexible dieting are kind of related? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Flexible dieting is this big umbrella yeah. under which all the approaches fit. And so flexible dieting would say, okay, you, you can be flexible in your approach to eating, whether it's more intuitive, mm-hmm. or whether you are quantifying every little gram. Okay. So the intuitive dieting approach would be more based on internal cues of hunger and satiety. Mm-hmm. And that's a great place to be, but it also helps to go through a boot camp learning period where you learn the values, the nutritive and, and caloric values of various foods in the portions that you happen to eat them. And then okay. you have this objective awareness of, of the amounts of foods that, that maintain you. Yes. So I think it's a very valuable skill to have to, to know that. And, and once you do, once you've achieved that, then working on hunger and satiety can be a, can be a good 
a valuable skill to have, especially if you live the kind of lifestyle where you're just pulled one direction and another, and you can't just necessarily settle down and figure out whether you're actually hungry or not when you're eating, or whether you're just using food to kind of medicate yourself or entertain yourself from boredom, mm -hmm. or whether you just have these eating rituals that are in place that have nothing to do with hunger or satiety. So yeah, I think, I think it's important that certain aspects of intuitive eating, getting in touch with your internal hunger and satiety cues. That's another really important skill. Yeah. Which I think is hard for people to do to really get in touch with their hunger. I don't think a lot of people understand that hunger is not necessarily an emergency and also yeah. like not really slowing down enough to know when they're actually full. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And what I take issue with, with like, I, I eat mindfully. I don't track anymore these days. I'm not saying I'll never, I never will again, but I don't need to track right now. I, like you said, I, I've honed those skills. I know what portions look like. I know the nutritional content of foods with like intuitive eating or any other named way of eating, essentially. What, what I don't like is that is the way, this is the only way, this is the best way. If you're not doing this, you're wrong. And that's, that's really what I take issue with, with all these other ways of eating. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. The whole movement about intuitive eating can get taken to an unproductive extreme too. There are yep. folks who will say intuitive eating is the end all. And anytime that you are denying let's say like denying your hunger or, or anytime that you start counting or tracking anything, then you're fostering some sort of dysfunctional eating uh, behaviors. That's not true either. That, that's no. kind of taking things so to, to another extreme. Yep. Yeah. And once again, it all goes back to what does the individual for thrive on? What, what approach clicks best with the individual? I, I do know people who actually love tracking everything. They're just those kind of people. It's almost like, telling somebody, how could you possibly be an accountant? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm an accountant and I love it. <laughs> and yeah. this tra tracking grams of everything. It's yeah. Fun. It's fun for me. Uh, and so you have to respect that. It, I like tracking actually. It's, it is fun for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, one of, I'm one of those. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have no issues I, with tracking. It's fun. I like also, I think people initially look at tracking as like restriction and I only have this much. When I look at it as a right, new person that I'm working with, ask them to look at it and more of like, what are you learning from this? Are you actually getting enough? Like, are you getting enough protein? Are you getting enough fiber? Let's like look at that mm -hmm. and learn about the foods that you're eating because most people don't really even know what a protein is sure. or what sure. fibers are, which I don't know why they, they should be teaching that stuff in school. That's a whole other topic, <laughs> but <laughs> um, a lot of people just awareness. don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yep. exactly. Love it for that. Mm -hmm. Cause you take somebody that's struggling to lose fat and that's a goal of theirs. They could be eating 3,500 calories a day when really they should be eating 2000 calories a day. It's cause they, they haven't been tracking and they have no awareness in that nutritional education. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's tremendous. I mean, the, the whole concept that people don't grasp there, there is a such thing as food quality, mm -hmm. but if all you know about is food quality, and you have no awareness of food quantity, mm -hmm. then you can take a high quality diet all the way to an early grave if you're eating yeah. overall too much. Right. In yeah. In terms of in terms of energy. And so, yeah, that's a concept that a lot of people in, in the general public are not aware of. Mm -hmm. Energy balance. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. there's of course there's people that say, no, that's outdated. That's uh, energy balances doesn't account for hormones and all this other stuff. I was like, yeah, actually it does. <laughs> it sure does. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I think another question, this is take, taking questions, what I get a lot, a mm -hmm. lot, a lot. So insulin resistance, this is a term thrown around TikTok comments and videos all the time, right? So what is it? How does it occur? And does it prevent fat loss? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In insulin <laughs> resistance is a, a state wherein your body basically produces a high amount of insulin in response to an overabundance of uh, metabolic fuels that you're taking in. And so insulin resistance, the way to cause insulin resistance in a nutshell is to chronically eat too much. doesn't matter what. 
It, it doesn't matter. It's if not carbs is what you're saying. It's, it doesn't matter what you're, what you're eating. It's, it doesn't matter what. Now, mm-hmm. uh, there are certain scenarios where just sort of logistically, it, it would be difficult to just eat an all, all protein diet or yeah. an all fat diet or all carb diet. But generally speaking, with, with people out there in the real world eating mixed diets, it is a matter of, of just eating overall too much mm-hmm. uh, on a daily basis. And that's how insulin resistance occurs. It's not a question of carbohydrate because like, for example, I can put somebody on an all bread diet. Mm -hmm. I can have them eat, let's say six slices of bread a day. How about even eight slices? How about 10 slices of bread a day? And if that amount of bread that they eat, it's probably going to be 800 to a thousand calories, at least lower than what maintains them. Mm -hmm. then they will witness an improvement in insulin sensitivity and insulin action over time because they're going to be losing body weight and body fat. Now, it's obviously not going to be an ideal weight loss situation because they won't be getting enough protein and they won't be getting complete micronutrition. But just to illustrate the point that it's not an insulin resistance is not a sole issue of just carbohydrate. So, so that's the first thing. When people think insulin resistance, they think, oh gosh, it's, it's something that happens when you eat too many carbs. Mm. Well, it's, it's more something that happens when you gain body fat cumulatively. And depending on your genetic proclivity, some people are going to be gaining a certain amount in the subcutaneous space and a certain amount in the visceral space. And insulin resistance occurs when you gain too much visceral body fat. And that causes all kinds of metabolic dysregulation at the micro level and then all the way to the macro level. And then you start gaining visceral fat and then you start decreasing um, your body's ability to metabolize metabolic fuels. And this would involve an over secretion of insulin. So insulin resistance is caused by eating too much. That is the primary cause of insulin okay. resistance. Yep. And it's not caused by carbs. It's caused by mm-hmm. eating. Or so having too many snacks, you mean? Like <laughs> or too free too frequently. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's no no no. Definitely not. It's it, but if you are accumulating body fat mm-hmm. by the end of the day or more like the end of the week, you're yep. progressively and continually accumulating body fat, then insulin resistance will follow that. So there's the whole question of what, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Does insulin resistance cause the accumulation of body fat? No, it doesn't. It's the other way around. The accumulation of body fat causes insulin resistance, period. And how do we accumulate body fat? By eating too much. How do we eat too much? By causing issues and problems around satiety and having... having not enough control over how much we eat in the course of the day. And there's several factors that influence that. It can be a matter of not moving around enough. Yeah. It can be a matter of just simply eating too much of the wrong stuff. That's highly energy dense. It can be a matter of having simply not enough protein and fiber and water in the diet and factors that increase satiety and hunger control. When we Mm -hmm. neglect those things, And some people can do this subconsciously as well, just by their suboptimal choices of food. They're they're constantly eating hyper palatable combinations of highly engineered ultra processed foods, and they're passively over consuming calories on a daily basis. That's one pathway to accumulating body fat and causing insulin resistance. So, So Beth, circling back to your question, Insulin resistance is a metabolic, is a chronic metabolic state caused by eating too much energy, too, too many calories Mm -hmm. over the course of basically week to week over the course of the the day in the course of the week and ongoing that that's what causes insulin resistance. So would you say a calorie deficit would help um, insulin resistance? Every time, every single time, the the best way that you do it with, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, regardless. The the best way to alleviate insulin resistance, reduce your body fat. How do how do you do that? Oh, there's many different ways to do that as long as any of those roads leads 
to a caloric deficit by the end of the day or the end of the week. So pick Amazing. one that you choose that you enjoy, right? Yes. <laughs> yes that's, said right. Yes. that's right. And there's certain negotiable ways to do it. And there's certain less negotiable ways to do it. Whenever mm-hmm. you, whenever you reduce calories for the purpose of losing body fat, or whenever you tip the energy balance scales into the negative, there's many different ways to do that. You can do that by increasing your energy out, or you can decrease it, or you can do it by decreasing your energy in, or you can do a combination of that. And there is an art to decreasing energy in. You're not just going to take your protein foods and throw them out the window. So you're eating less. It's usually a matter of making sure you have enough protein and then reducing elsewhere in the carb and or fat departments of the diet in order to impose that, that caloric deficit by the end of the week. And there's many different ways to do that. Right. Yeah. I think find a way that works for you. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think many people, most, most people would agree we're not consuming enough protein as it is. So that's a really mm-hmm. good, most people would agree on that. I don't think everybody does, but I think most people do, but in that whole equation is the movement um, thing that you talked about earlier. And that's something that you have direct control of your, your movement. And that's something we talk about so much on this podcast is like, mm-hmm. just get up and move, go for a walk. We, we, we highly recommend these daily walks just to get our, our overall needs and activity levels up which then can have that healthy behavior and trickle down to, to making better f- uh, decisions with your diet. Yeah. M- movement things. is tremendous. Uh, mm-hmm. Physical activity side of things is tremendous. And it can be a really big thing for people who have been consciously dieting and restricting for months or mm-hmm. sometimes on and off for years. And they've yep. never taken a break from that. Yeah. A lot of times when, when somebody has been dieting for, let's say a few months, six months, 12 months or more, then they get the psychological fatigue that happens with, with dieting. So it's, it's diet, diet fatigue. And sometimes the best solution is to take the focus off of, of restricting and shift that focus over to something else like, like physical performance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, there actually was a study done by Clark and colleagues not too long ago where it, it was a two-year study mm-hmm. on obese individuals. And they, they gave them a baseline diet with the just kind of basic guidelines. It was sort of an interesting diet. It was a not, it was a non-ketogenic low carb diet, like well, uh, a max of hundred grams of, of carbs, or was it 90, 90 to hundred grams of carbs a day. And protein was set at about one and a half grams per kilogram of, of body weight. So like roughly 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 grams per pound. And they told the subjects to not weigh, don't weigh yourself. Don't focus on weight loss. Don't even think about the scale. What we're going to do is focus on improving these certain endurance and strength parameters through this particular exercise program. And so the subjects were specifically instructed to focus on performance improvements. I love and that. by the, by the end of the two years, they lost a, a like a spectacular amount of body weight and body fat. And it was a really successful experiment in the direction of focusing on performance instead of the scale. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Did they incur a caloric deficit? Heck yes, they did. And they were able to maintain it. It's just that their psychological approach to the program was different because they had been maintaining this hyper-focus on restricting and the scale, Mm -hmm. restrict the scale, restrict the scale. And all it took was just kind of a shift away from constant focus on body weight yeah. to finally break, break that cycle. So to your point about physical activity, that can definitely be manipulated effectively in order to influence energy balance towards weight loss and fat loss. And it's not, it doesn't always have to be about the energy inside of the equation. Totally. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, for sure. You also mentioned something in there about chronically restricting six months, 12 months, so on and so forth, which which could bring up a good discussion, which is reverse dieting. This is mm-hmm. something I think this is really catching a lot of popularity these days because we're mm-hmm. I know we're definitely receiving a lot of questions about it. Yeah. So first of all, is it necessary to reverse diet? And in which situations would you recommend it? Or what is a reverse diet if we break yeah. it down to its core? Yeah. Course? Sure, sure. The the origin of reverse dieting was post physique contest protocol building. Okay, that's the origin of it. Where after after you diet for a contest, 
whether it be fitness, figure, bodybuilding, bikini, you can imagine the the competitor just basically starved themselves for three to six months. Yeah. And so you're in this highly unique psychological and, and, and physiological state where your instincts, every instinct you have is geared towards survival and eliminating the caloric deficit and, and basically recovering from, from prolonged starvation. And so the post-contest meal protocol, it, st- it started becoming really important because when you don't give competitors a post-contest meal protocol, what they will tend to do is just binge for literally like one to three days straight. Mm. And there's many stories of, of people gaining 10, 20 pounds, 10, 20 ish pounds, yep. sometimes more in, in the following week or so after the, con- after the contest. And so what some coaches decided to do was structure a program where there's a specific post contest meal and then a gradual lead back up to maintenance after the, the contest prep. So some of this is good and some of this was bad. And the bad of it was a lot of coaches took this graduating up to kind of an extreme where all you could do was add like 10 grams of carbs and 10 grams of protein back each week. And then what ended up happening is instead of getting competitors out of the caloric deficit as soon as possible, they ended up dragging that deficit out for okay. another few months after the contest because the, the the road up back to maintenance was too gradual. And so we took a look at that reverse dieting model and decided, okay, that's that's counterproductive. What we need to do is get people back to maintenance as soon as possible. And sometimes with um, physique competitors, if you do that too quickly, they they won't be psychologically ready for it. They, their gut microbiome won't necessarily be ready for that in terms of the bloating and, and swelling and, and their body, their bodies won't necessarily be immediately ready for that in terms of like just edema of the, the feet and hands. And mm-hmm. it's a bunch of crazy stuff that happens when you, you get people back to maintenance too quickly. And so in my observations, getting people back to maintenance, taking a maximum of, of two weeks to do it was, was right around the sweet spot. Okay. If you can get, if you can get there in the week, even better. Yeah. But usually within two weeks, you're back to maintenance. You're good. Okay. So that was the original model of reverse dieting that caught some backlash from folks like myself. who were seeing that coaches were just keeping people in, in hypocaloric states for way too long for too much of the year. And then another model of reverse dieting is something that we've known forever as an increase in G flux or an increase in energy flux where you, alongside of increasing calories, you increase activity. And so it's sort of this, this simultaneous increase in, in both sides of an energy in and energy out. And you, and, and when, when the energy out is pacing alongside of the increases in energy in, then you see a lot less fat gain during that process. And so with a gradual increase in calories, you're increasing training volume and that is, that's a legit form of reverse dieting that causes okay. that's it's in a lot of cases, it can be a win-win because you're seeing strength go up. You're seeing body composition improve in, in the sense of gaining lean body mass without an appreciable amount of body fat. And sometimes it, the body fat is actually maintained while you're gaining lean mass. And you can go through periods of this where it looks like you're reverse dieting, but really what you're doing is you're just increasing what we call energy flux. So higher energy in plus higher energy out. Okay. Okay. What you mentioned something in there, which is the psychological aspect. And that's something that I see a lot with my lifestyle clients and just the general public that comes to us with questions is for instance, a lot of these crash diets are putting people on 900 calories, 1000 calories, and they're doing this for many cycles on end. And the, just the idea of eating more calories scares the living hell out of them. So, so I guess the way I, the way I've kind of used reverse dieting in that regard is just by introducing more calories slowly over time, just to get them mentally adjusted to the idea of more calories and that they're not actually a bad thing. Yeah. 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 The, the phenomenon of getting people on, on very low calories, like you said, 900, a thousand, 
that's that's pretty common also actually in the mm -hmm. physique contest community it's really kind of a terrible thing because it, it just sustains the, a phenomenon known as low energy availability and in women it, it can manifest as particularly troubling physiological outcomes the the cessation disturbance and cessation of the menstrual cycle mm -hmm. that's a common thing with low energy availability and then down the line it sets people up for osteopenia osteoporosis and just a bunch of terrible things associated with the so-called female athlete triad um the the whole idea of, of people being able to sustain these low amounts of calories it's kind of mixed in with with binging that goes unreported uh, in a lot of the cases and so with competitors there there is a a strong element of avoiding shame and avoiding having to report to the coach who's kind of putting everything into the program just as the competitor is there's there's a major component of avoiding shame and there's a lot of binging that goes on behind the scenes mm. and so one binge episode can run anybody from like three to six thousand calories mm -hmm. and so when you factor that in in the course of the week where they're supposedly taking in a thousand calories a day then this is how they maintain that so it, it, it's the dark side of of dieting for yeah. sure and it's not talked about enough and it's also not talked about enough that competing in physique is a combination of testing your will and genuinely engaging in the spirit of competition and trying to better yourself but you always have one foot in the pond of, of risking an eating disorder so that's kind of the unique thing about physique competition it's all these great things except for this one bad thing that's really fucking bad. <laughs> yeah. Which is development of eating disorders. That's yep. the thing. Yeah. I did an ab, an ab challenge a couple of years ago to show how actually hard it is to get to a level of leanness, right? I did RP. I got really, really lean and I loved the way I looked, right? But was it sustainable? No. But also now I see myself reflecting back on that going, I wish I was there again, but to get there is absolutely brutal. So yeah. I can see like, and I wasn't even competing. I did this as like a challenge on Instagram and my mind was already like in that getting kind of, you start to get body dysmorphia of where you are normally compared to that level of leanness. And it's a, it's a, it's a spiral. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and I think that this conversation isn't had enough mm -mm. Among, amongst all sports. So you can take any sport really and like mixed martial arts, <laughs> all right? It's pretty obvious what the risks are, but it's a sport and, and people do it knowing that there's risks involved. Ironically, with a sport like physique competition, people go in there not even aware of and not even privy to the, to the, the risks, the psychological risks mm -hmm. of conditioning a certain type of set of behaviors and perceptions uh, of your of your body, of food, and how it affects your body, and how those feelings affect your self esteem and your just your general outlook on life. Um, and a lot of times, with with other sports, you can kind of leave it behind when practice is over. But with something like physique contest prep, you never leave it behind as long mm -hmm. as you're awake. And so, yeah, it it can be pretty treacherous. Yeah. I don't think people understand when they look at someone with that physique, let's say on social media, that what they do to actually get that sacrifices yep. and the yeah. beating they're mm -hmm. taking and yeah. And how, yeah, a lot of people, thankfully more and more people are starting to talk about that, how achieving that level of leanness and then even maintaining it is mm -hmm. what, what it takes and how unhealthy it can actually be. We have this distorted right. view of health, honestly, and right. how that, how, that that level of leanness means healthy when really everything we just talked about that's the opposite of healthy in mm -hmm. a way. yeah old school nasm had a definition of sport of what what is a sport and it was any activity that pulls your body apart and challenges you to keep your body together so that was nasm's old definition of sport and that really does apply to everything from boxing to physique competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. So wow. we we talked a little bit about protein in there and how most people could be benefiting from increasing protein, for instance, and how that can be controlled in a lot of different diets. And we, we, we get a lot of questions about protein absorption and what's the optimal amount of protein or more, more specifically, how much protein can we actually absorb at once? And you hear this number thrown around a lot and it's like 30 grams per of protein per meal. What, what is the optimal amount and the correct answer there? Yeah, this question it never dies because mm-hmm. honestly, oh, it won't ever die because number one, it doesn't have an easy answer. And, right. and number two, people keep just pumping out misinformation on it that just never seems to die. But mm-hmm. so the, the thing we have to do first is distinguish between protein absorption and absorption. that dige- And when I say absorption, I mean the whole process of just ingestion, digestion, absorption, utilization for you you can you have to distinguish between protein absorption and the anabolic response so the anabolic response would be measured in most cases by muscle protein synthesis right two different things so once we establish that there's protein absorption and utilization digestion the whole thing and anabolic response once we can do that then things can become a lot more clear so the amount of protein we can digest, absorb, use for various bodily processes, vast majority of, of, of the protein that we ingest, it doesn't honestly does not matter what the size of the meal is. The body will use the vast majority over 90, some throw around numbers like 95% of, of the protein that we ingest will get used for some sort of metabolic process. Okay. And and also depending on homeostatic demands, some of it will get oxidized for, for energy, but none of it just in quotes goes to waste. It just excreted. Just... Like a lot of people say, you're just, you're just pooping it out or whatever. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. That that's the, the misconception. Mm-hmm. That is a, this is a gnarly misconception. Okay. Uh, not uh, over 90% of it gets either used mm-hmm. or, or oxidized for, for in the mix of fuels. So that is the, the digestion and absorption side of, of the concept. Okay. Now, the other side of it that we have to make a distinguishing, we have to draw a line here is the anabolic response or muscle protein synthesis. So there is a limited amount of protein that can be used towards muscle protein synthesis. And so while there it really is no practical limit to the amount of protein that we can digest and absorb in a single sitting because the body will take as long as it needs to, to digest and absorb it. We, if we, absorb, for example, if we consume like a pound of meat, the body will take all day, all day to digest and absorb. The body's got various brake systems, various sphincter systems from here, all the way through the digestive tract to make sure that there's a very tightly controlled flow of broken down nutrients through through the through systemic circulation and through these structures, digestive structures in the body, it can take all day to absorb it, and it will absorb and use over ninety percent of it. Muscle protein synthesis is a whole different thing, where there appears to be a limit and a ceiling of how high muscle protein synthesis goes per dose of protein, and this has been studied pretty vigorously over the last at least 20 years. And we've looked at different protocols, different protein types, different doses. And we've come to the conclusion that younger folks in their younger adults in their twenties or so, they have potentially a lower ceiling of muscle protein, protein dosing that maxes out muscle protein synthesis. So younger adults are actually more sensitive to the anabolic response to protein feeding than that older surprises adults. Me, actually. Well, older adults uh, can incur a phenomenon called age-related anabolic resistance, where it mm-hmm. just requires a larger dose to kind of wake up the anabolic machinery in, in older adults. They're slower to warm, <laughs> so to speak. Okay. And okay. so, and so what we found over the years is that in younger folks, Protein doses around 25 to 40 ish grams. So it seems to be the range. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And when I was going to say 20, 25 to, to 30 grams, but there was some newer research that came down the pike by McNaughton and colleagues, I believe it was 2016, either 2014 or 2016, where they took a look at the muscle protein synthesis response of either a 20 gram dose or a 40 gram dose of protein after a high volume resistance training bout. So up, up until just 2014, 2016, when McNaughton and colleagues did their thing, we had only been testing low volume resistance training sessions, like a few sets of, of leg extensions and a few sets of leg press, and then test different doses of protein on muscle protein synthesis. So finally, McNaughton and colleagues tested a full body, a full body resistance training session, and they compared 20 versus 40 grams of protein in younger subjects. And they saw, mm -hmm. lo and behold, for the first time, younger subjects maxed out their, actually had a higher muscle protein synthetic response with 40 grams of protein instead of 20 grams of protein. Whereas all the research prior to that saw this cutoff of like 20, 25-ish grams of protein as the ceiling of protein dosing to max out muscle mm -hmm. protein synthesis in younger people. Whereas in older people, it was a little bit closer to the 35 40 ish gram. But for the first time, we used higher resistance training volume and saw that it created a larger sink for uh, muscle protein. So, with that out of the way, with, with that little bit out of the way, what we can say now is that the amount of protein that maxes out muscle protein synthesis can depend on age, it can depend on the volume of the training session, but it falls somewhere right in the neighborhood of 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. And that's right around this, a quarter of a gram per pound. Okay. So that's kind of the, I would say that that's the, the lower end of what we can expect to be the maximum dosing of protein that maxes out muscle protein synthesis. And on the higher end, in some of the higher outliers with some of the older subjects on some of the higher volume exercise protocols, it can be as high as 0.6 grams per pound of body weight. That, that would be the ceiling dose for maximizing muscle protein synthesis. And so these figures worked out really well with when my colleague and I, Brad Schoenfeld, we, we did a paper called how much protein in a single sitting maximizes muscle building. I think that was the, the title. I, I, I rarely remember the, the titles of my papers, but, but if you do a good, <laughs> if you do a Google search on simply yeah. Alan Aragon, how much protein, mm -hmm. if you do that search, it'll I be the, saw that one the other day, actually. So somebody in Facebook was on Facebook was arguing with me. So telling me that I was wrong about what I was talking about with protein absorption. And they literally cited that paper. And I'm like, and they, they misquoted you, of course, what you were talking about in the paper. I'm like, did you read the same paper that you just cited to me? Because that's not what he's saying there. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's always, man, the, the golden age of, of Facebook and uh, being yeah. able to come in and, and, and uh, clear these things up. It just doesn't happen anymore. But, but, but yeah, yeah that, that paper, in that paper, we discussed what is the way that you can dose protein mm -hmm. to maximize muscle protein synthesis per meal and looking at the data uh, as a whole, it kind of comes down to 0.4 to 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per meal. That, that would be mm. the, the magic protein dose that maximizes muscle protein synthesis. And so a different question would be, what's the maximum amount of protein that you can use in a meal? Well, you have to say, you all use for what? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. Only a, only a fraction of it will go towards muscle protein synthesis. And, so, and so the rest this will goes back go to, to what you've ver said. Have various other metabolic fates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's person dependent, just like with pretty much everything you've been talking about. It's, it's person dependent on the mm -hmm. ways of diets and fat loss and everything like that. Yeah. And, and like what, this question about, about what's the maximal amount of protein that you can consume to maximize the anabolic response. We also have to ask for whom is that answer important Right. for, for some folks who have their main goal is I, I want to build muscle. I want to gain size. I want to take up more space. I want to, I want to need to like turn to the side when I walk through a, a door <laughs> sill, man, for that person, 
th- that would matter. They, they would want to follow a protocol that maximized muscle protein synthesis at every meal. Now, for somebody who wants to maintain their muscle mass and all they care about is losing fat, let's say, then that, that doesn't matter. That yeah. really doesn't matter. They, they can choose to eat as many or as few protein rich meals in the course of the day as they want, because it's not going to impact their goal. Right. Boom. Yeah. When someone from like the general population, you know, can I, am I getting too much protein? It's like, mm, no, you're good. Yeah, I, I right. think, I think you're okay. And it's funny because with so many people afraid of carbs, they're, they're eating like 40 grams of protein a day. I'm mm. like, what are you eating? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That That's really important. I want to wedge this in. I, I know we're running up on time, but the, the, the hierarchy of importance for protein intake is really important to keep in mind. So of first importance is the total daily amount of protein you consume mm-hmm. per day. That is by far and away the most important variable for protein programming, protein intake. And for most people, that's going to be somewhere between 0.7 to 1.0 grams per pound mm-hmm. of, of target body weight. Yep. So that, that's the, the figure that you want to kind of burn into your brain. And then of distant secondary importance is the distribution and the dosing of, of that total daily protein that that is totally secondary in terms of impact. Mm -hmm. And then like even third way down the line is timing of those protein doses relative to the training bout. And so, yeah, that that's an important hierarchy to keep in mind. Some people are just focused on the icing on the cake when they really be needing, needing to focus on the cake, which is total daily amount of protein yes. at the end of the day. foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Keep it simple. Mm-hmm. Just get your, get your protein in Yep. by the end of the day. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't protein. worry about it. Yeah. Just eat your fucking protein. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, Alan, thank you so much for being here. And I want to let everyone know to please, if you are looking for a good nutrition book, flexible dieting by Alan Aragon is a must. Um, I gotta tell you, this is better than my nutrition book that um, I had for school. Just so you guys know, oh, man. It's a uh, it, re- it really is. It's very easy read. I always, I get asked a lot, like, what's what's a really good nutrition book? And actually, now I can refer them. Thankfully, to this we have this because, now. Because before, I'm like, mm, I don't really my school book. Yeah. So this really amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I appreciate really you guys. Is. I appreciate you guys. We only scratched the surface, so. We did. I know, I know. Thanks so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you guys on the interwebs. The interwebs. See you on the interwebs. To the interwebs we go. Absolutely. Hope you enjoyed this episode. So why not share with a friend who needs to hear it? Send us a DM on Instagram or email us at cutthecrappod at gmail.com and join our Patreon at patreon.com slash cutthecrappodcast. As always, we appreciate you and thanks for being here.